you go right back to the very beginning when Europeans were first coming in and they were kind of starting to destroy the land, our people admonished them then. And there's different writings and recordings of spokesmen telling the early colonists about how to live and why they were supposed to live this way and to follow the, you know, follow this, uh, this natural law. And colonists oftentimes refuse, much to their own detriment as well. And, you know, many times their colonies fail. The point of it is that when you take that and pass that through time and bring it up to the current time that we're in right now, you see that our message has always been the same about how people need to live, how people need to be, how we need to understand the world, how we need to understand ourselves and our relationship to the natural world. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, and my co-host for this show is Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, though he's not joining us for today's conversation. Over this summer, I've been reading Being Salmon, Being Human by the Norwegian author Martin Lee Mueller. Central to this book is an exploration of the differences between how the modern aquaculture industry, born in the author's home country of Norway, treats salmon simply as commodities, compared with how the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, specifically the Klaalam people, with whom the author has spent a great deal of time, have treated salmon over at least the last 7,000 years as part of a web of relations, their extended family upon which they both rely and to which they owe responsibilities. The book points out that Indigenous people in the Americas have long had the technological capacity to over-harvest species like salmon if they were to choose to, but that central to the notion of being Indigenous, of indigeneity, are the knowledge, social structures, and forms of governance developed over many generations of inhabitation and embeddedness in place, that make it possible to use and live within diverse environments, even under considerable human population densities, over, in quotes, mind-boggling, from a European perspective, spans of time. With our guest today, I'm hoping we can begin to unpack these issues, discussing both what specific Indigenous knowledges and perspectives have to say about what it means to live in relation to the land, water, and other species, And then also to look at what the founding treaties between Canada's Indigenous people and the Crown in the colonial context mean from the perspective of Indigenous people. What do Indigenous perspectives on knowledge and governance imply for how we relate to one another and the environment in Canada today? I'll be talking about these issues with Dr. Dan Longboat and Larry McDermott. Dan is a Turtle Clan member of the Mohawk Nation and a citizen of the Rotanashoni originally from Oswakin, the Six Nations community on the Grand River. Dan is an associate professor in the Chani Wenjak School for Indigenous Studies at Trent University and founding director of the Indigenous Environmental Science and Studies Program, granting both Bachelors of Arts and Bachelors of Science degrees since 2009. This program is an innovative and multidisciplinary undergraduate program that brings together principles of both Indigenous and Western knowledge systems for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous learners. And then Larry McDermott is Algonquin from Shabot Obadjuan First Nation. He's also Executive Director of Plenty Canada. Larry is actively involved with numerous organizations, including the International Indigenous Forum for Biodiversity, the Canadian Environmental Network, UNESCO, and the Ontario Recovery Strategy for the American Eel. A former three-time mayor and longtime council member of Lanark Highlands, Larry was the first chair of the Rural Forum of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. He also served as a commissioner for the Ontario Human Rights Commission and was on the Ontario Species at Risk Public Advisory Committee. Miigwech and Niawan to each of you for joining us on the Ecopolitics podcast today. Dan, given how I set up this show, I'd like to begin with asking you a question about what being Indigenous means to you in the context of the environmental education work that you do at places like Trent University and beyond. You're Mohawk, which is one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Longhouse Peoples. Your people have lived in this part of North America for many, many generations. What does it mean to bring a Haudenosaunee perspective to the work that you do in environmental and sustainability education? 
Well, great question, Peter. Let me maybe first start by saying, uh, Greetings, everyone. I almost just said, And I said, What's the Dana Gwegoscano. And I hope that you are happy, well, and at peace. So uh, I'm very happy to be here today. So, Roroya Gewen Niankets, Ganyangeha, Ganyakya Dodo, and Ganyato Onora, Niwagita Rodo. Um, as uh, Peter had mentioned, uh, my, I'm a Mohawk turtle clan from uh, uh, Oswego and uh, down at Grand River Territory, and I'm very happy to be participating with uh, with my good friend Larry McDermott and uh, with you, Peter, uh, another good friend and longtime friend. So I'm uh, very happy to be here today. So um, our kind of knowledge system for us, as uh, in particular as Haudenosaunee, is it, uh, our knowledge system is embedded within our language. And uh, so when we look at, you know, what does it mean to be Indigenous? We don't have a, a word uh, that, you know, is, is similar to Indigenous. Our, our closest word that we would have would be Ongwe Hongwe. Ongwe refers to your, uh, your like your physical being, not your physical body. Your physical body is Oyada, uh, but your physical being uh, for as Ongwe, as opposed to your spiritual being. Uh Hongwe, whenever you hear Hongwe on the end of a word, like Ata Ongwe, uh, that means your Ata is your shoes, and Ongwe would be, uh, Ata Ongwe would be moccasins, the real one. And so Ongwe then it often refers to the real or the original one. So when we talk about what it means to be indigenous, we uh, take that word apart, Ongwe Hongwe, the real people, the original people. And the understanding of that is not just like you're the kind of real people and, and everybody else is knockoffs of you. It's really talking about that to call yourselves Ongwe Hongwe, to call yourself a real human being, you are responsible for, connected to, are a carrier for, and you're an exemplary of the original instructions that we were given as human beings at, our, at the time of our creation that's embedded within our creation teachings. And so they talk to us then about those original instructions about how to be. There's a whole lot of them, uh, but they actually tell us then, you know, about how we're supposed to be in the world, how we're supposed to live, to have great love for one another, to um, learn how to live within the cycles and balances of the natural world, and to uh, give thanks. And that's only three short ones over a, a quite a long uh, list of, of, of instructions. But the idea behind it is that you become the living example of all of those pieces. So in order for you to be an indigenous person, you know, you are meant to be living in a, in a world uh, and to exude the love, kindness, compassion, empathy, respect, honor, trust, all of those beautiful things that we oftentimes refer to uh, sort of sim symbolically as, as the good mind or gotten to go real. It means a beautiful mind. And to be, uh, and this doesn't mean your your mind, like your brain. It means mindfulness. Um, and again, keeping in mind that the language is uh, is based on, you know, a very high percentage, 70, 80 percent of our language is verb based. So it really comes down to uh, understanding that it's a description of different things. So to be on, uh, to be an indigenous person, to be an uh, Ongwe Hongwe, means then that you exude all of those principles and those original instructions that we were given at the time of creation of the human beings that we have faithfully carried and and enabled us to live uh, in a in a way that uh, has worked to sustain and to perpetuate and to con and, and to work for the continuation of life, and that's really what uh, really being indigenous is all about that any people anywhere in the world that call themselves indigenous or coming from the land or coming from that place or being the real people have had to live in a way that uh, works symbiotically with the natural world. So much so that, you know, the question then becomes, did, did, did the culture make the environment or did the environment make the culture? Uh, and I think the idea behind it is that the, the cultures living in place over millennia have been able to survive and exist in a way that works in a beautiful uh, symbiotic relationship with the natural world that has enabled both the natural world as well as the human world to be able to flourish, not just subsist, not, not just, you know, to sustain themselves, but to actually flourish as a civilization, as human beings. That doesn't mean in the quality or of the, you know, in, in the, let's call it the quantity of life and the material possessions, it's really talking about a quality of life that really has enabled, you know, great health, 
great physical strength and, and great uh, great uh, sense of of uh, of mindfulness. Great, uh, I want to call it a, a spiritual integrity and spiritual power. All of those elements that we see that you know, mind, body, and spirit uh, are all tied together, and and that becomes a a way of the human beings. Nature, the human beings are tied together in that relationship. And so, um, you know, as we hopefully we go through this, we have a chance to talk a little bit more about indigenous knowledge. Then we can talk about the the roots of that and the understandings that's embedded within the knowledge system. But that's really, you know, what how we uh, bring forward our understanding of that. Because again, at the end of the day, we are all as human beings, we are all indigenous from somewhere. To quote my good friend uh, Joe Sheridan from York University. Uh, Understanding that we are all indigenous from somewhere, we some peoples have left their homeland and, and and have chose to live different places, and really in order to be able to sustain and to perpetuate life, then it comes down to having an understanding of the importance of and the relevant and the critical value of indigenous ways of life and learning from those if you're going to choose to live in the places uh, anywhere in the world so that the ecosystem human beings can continue to flourish. So that's what we bring to school. That's what we teach in our classes. And uh, that's what uh, our perspective has been with great success. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dan, for opening it up. And and yes, indeed, welcome to the podcast. And I'm now going to see if we can bring Larry in on this conversation. And and first off, welcome to you, Larry, to the Ecopolitics podcast. And I'd like to ask the same question of you. What does being Algonquin from Shabbat Obadjuan First Nation mean for you in terms of how you approach the work you've done over the years, which has been all over the map, right? Working on human rights issues as a local government counselor in Lanark Highlands, or working with a variety of organizations and efforts intended to protect biodiversity in Canada and beyond. What has it meant to be Algonquin doing that work? Quay, quay, Peter. Uh, Chi miigwech for the opportunity to uh, uh, share with you. Uh, and uh, I'll respond to that question. Uh, many things uh, pop in my head, especially when you brought in, uh, you know, the other uh, areas that I've worked in. I think of the Convention on Biological Diversity and uh, having been at, in Rio in 1992 uh, and sharing uh, with other Indigenous peoples, elders who have since passed, amazing uh, elders, uh, and uh, the wisdom that they shared, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna back up from that and just say that uh, for me at conception the responsibility that comes with that gift of life is to celebrate uh, life and to accept the responsibility for the continuation of life that we are the bridge between ancestors that came before us and uh, future generations, both uh, born and unborn. Uh, in fact, we often talk of uh, seven generations in, in both directions uh, and how that affects uh, the path we walk. The core of being Algonquin, and it's expressed in the, in the language, as uh, Dan has pointed out, the gift of life is, is a life that's more than mere subsistence. It's a beautiful life. and we believe that uh, that everyone has the opportunity to, to live that life. In Algonquin, we say mino pimata uh, and that, I guess, somewhat translated to English is, is to live that good life. And we live that good life um, when we are in, in harmony with natural law, um, when we recognize um, that the, the life within us as the same as uh, the life within all of creation, um, and that uh, uh, we aren't separate, that what we think, what we do, how we carry ourselves uh, affects the whole universe, and we have a responsibility to make sure that uh, in expressing our, our gratitude uh, for this life we're given, uh, to recognize that responsibility. And so we're given certain ceremonies in our tradition 
uh, then we recognize that that's part of our culture and keeping those uh, ceremonies and passing those ceremonies on to uh, the next generation so that they can keep those ceremonies uh, alive. And through those ceremonies, uh, we are able to communicate uh, to our ancestors, to all of creation, uh, and to make sure that uh, those ripples that we create in the pond, the pond, the spiritual pond of life, uh, are done with good intentions and uh, with that uh, good heart and mind. Um, so that's that's uh, for me at the core of uh, what being Algonquin means. Um, I have found myself in a uh, diversity of uh, of life experiences. I was very fortunate to have good elders around me uh, in circumstances where um, I was clearly a minority. There was clearly uh, a, a Western culture. I'm I'm true to our teachings, but I'm also mindful that at times. I'm an ambassador for other indigenous peoples, um, but I, I try to be careful about how I represent myself, and I rep- represent myself as an Algonquin. But I, uh, I, I've had the great good fortune traveling internationally, and I've seen common denominators, certainly in terms of uh, um, our stories, uh, our, our ways of knowing, and uh, uh, an understanding of our core responsibilities. Miigwech. Miigwech, uh, Larry. Uh, what I'm really hearing from the two of you, that it's, it's sort of some common denominators, is this uh, clearly a strong sense of uh, of identity and responsibility, um, and uh, sort of an ethic of how to live. An ethic being, I guess, a a Western word for it, but uh, the good mind that uh, Dan was talking about. Um, and how this is embedded in culture and language, ceremonies. Um, and, uh, you know, the sense I have from both of you is that, uh, and you've expressly said this, uh, Larry, you know, you, you've often experienced yourself as a minority living in this Western world and, uh, and perhaps as an ambassador for um, these values. Uh, and, and indeed, it's a big part of why we're talking about with both of you here today in the context of uh, the environmental crisis, when so many people are, and many of our students are, are looking to see what we can um, um, learn from uh, people who have lived on the land for uh, very long periods of time compared to uh, Western culture, which tends to be rather, uh, has a short time frame in mind, let's say. So, so Dan, you were talking about indigenous knowledge, which is very much part of language for you. Um, students might be familiar with the term indigenous knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge we sometimes hear. Um, and then uh, Larry referred to uh, the Anishinaabe concept of uh, mino. Let's see if I get it right. Uh, mino mibatsiwen. Uh, which means the good life and involves concepts of revival, rebirth, and renewal. Um, for you as Haudenosaunee, what does Indigenous knowledge mean to you, and how do you understand its relevance in relation to the environmental crisis that we're all going through these days? Uh, how do you think Indigenous knowledge, uh, if it can, or how do you think it can help us uh, find a pathway out of this mess? I think that, you know, if you kind of look back and, uh, and again, you know, you look at the, some of the literature that's been created over, you know, the, the, the past few decades that recognizes Indigenous knowledge and talks about that. And you look back even further into anthropology and, and ethnology. And, uh, you know, they oftentimes make reference to Indigenous knowledge, something along the lines of, and I, you know, and again, uh, you know, keeping in mind that, uh, people, by and large, don't know about, you know, the the nature of Indigenous knowledge. But Madame Brunton, when she did uh, her work on our, our common future and brought that sort of light to Indigenous knowledge, where she talked about the, uh, uh, in terms of sustainable development, that the knowledge that Indigenous peoples have in living in place for a very long period of time, you know, is of great benefit to all of humanity. She kind of really put a spotlight on Indigenous knowledge. And when you go back and you look at kind of the the definition, the common understanding or definition of indigenous knowledge within, you know, the Western Academy, 
you know, of anthropology and of ethnology, et cetera. Um, and now environmental science is really talking about the idea that, you know, Indigenous peoples living in place over a long period of time have been able to amass a, a huge amount of knowledge of what it means to live in place through a process of trial and error. Uh, I mean, the first part is probably right, but the second part is like, you know, nothing further from the truth uh, than that is that our people never lived by trial and error. When you start to look at the the tens of thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands, if not the, you know, the millions upon millions of combinations of plant medicines uh, and, and other medicines, you know, animal, tree, birds, fish, all of those things as medicines, um, and you look at the possible combinations of them in treating, uh, you know, human health conditions, human illness and human sickness and disease, like you can't look at the possible combinations of all of those medicines and create through trial and error. I don't care if you lived, you know, for a, a million years in a place, you just, it's just the, uh, the physics or the math behind it is just too astronomical. Like you'd, you'd never do it. But the people have done it. They've used, you know, medicines to treat human health and, and illnesses. The point of it is, is that uh, our knowledge didn't come from trial and error. When you go back and you begin to look at the oral tradition, it talks about recognizing the integrity of the knowledge in terms of that our peoples, our great ancestors, their minds were so good and their hearts were so pure that they could actually talk to creation they could actually talk to all of nature the natural world and so whenever they needed uh, certain things and when you go back and again in in, uh, in our creation teaching it talks about that when uh, various elements were made they were given instructions just like as i referred to as the original instructions for the human beings all things in creation all things in the natural world have their own instructions we just have to understand that all of these things are working for the continuation of life Nothing works for its own demise. Understanding that and looking at the nature of the knowledge, whenever the people needed knowledge or needed to address something, they went to the natural world and they simply asked them. And they came and either they manifested themselves to our great ancestors in, in, a, in a form and spoke to them. They came in dreams. They came in visions. And in the process of doing that, they came forward and they said, like as in treating that, they came forward. Here's the medicines that you will use to treat the conditions that's plaguing the people right now. And they gave us those medicines. And they said, so not only did they give up their own lives to help support us, the human beings, but then they also gave us the songs, the dances, the words, the practice uh, that goes with all of those things. And it was our responsibility then to, uh, to use those medicines. But at the same time, as Larry talked about, our responsibility is to also give them back. It's a reciprocal relationship. So while they give their lives up for us, we give them back our gratitude, our appreciation, our respect, our honor to them and care for them in whatever capacity that we can to care for them so that both plants and animals or both the natural world and the human beings are intricately tied together and have, you know, have carried one another right from the very first breath of the first human beings all the way up until the very last breath of the last human beings, whenever that's going to be. That knowledge then comes from a place of spirit, which is different than from Western understandings of the world, where uh, all knowledge has come uh, not from a place of spirit, but from the minds of human beings, and not just all human beings, but only certain human beings, men, and not all men, but only white men. And so to you know, build a, an entire existence on the minds of, of men, which are fallible, when you go back and you uh, contrast that with and compare that with indigenous knowledge that wh where that knowledge comes from a place of spirit, and it, it has carried and enabled our people to flourish, you know, through thousands of generations of human beings right up to where we are today, it still has the capacity to enable us to continue to flourish on for many, many more generations. And let's maybe hope another thousand generations ahead of us. But the point of it is that we have that responsibility to engage with that knowledge, to respect it, to understand it, to live it. And that becomes part of, as Larry talked about, that minobomadzu. And that's a beautiful, you know, Anishinaabek word that talks about, you know, um, uh, when I spoke to um, my good friend, Shirley Williams, 
She said, sometimes when you'll see, not always, but when you see that win on the end of the word, mina bomadza win, uh, she says that means it has to do with the art of something. And she says, and when you look at that, she says, it means the art of living well. It's like, oh man, the art of living well. What does that mean? So our people are not only involved in, in science of understanding and knowledge and being able to live in the world, but it's also an art form to be able to live well. As, uh, so when you start to put those things together and understand the nature of language, understanding the nature of, of our knowledge, that knowledge comes from a place that is perfect. And the only reason that it may not be working now, we can say, oh, this thing is not right or that's not going well. We failed in our to maintain our relationship with nature as human beings, we fail to maintain that. And so now we're, you know, uh, now we're seeing the brunt of that because uh, as Larry talked about, there are natural laws and there are processes that our ancestors have understood and have passed on to us and we pass on to coming generations. And more so now we pass on to everyone because uh, again, you know, we can be as indigenous peoples, we can be as green as we want to be and be, you know, uh, as kind of, uh, you know, w sustainable as we want. But at the end of the day, we live in a world where everybody else is all around us. And so we need to be able to teach that as well. And you go back to, you know, some of the early discussions amongst the Mohawk Nation way back in the late 60s and early 70s when they picked men to be able to say, you're staying home and you're going to learn these songs and you're going to carry on our traditions within the community. But some of you other ones will go out and you'll, you will share our knowledge and share our understanding of it because they had a firm belief way back then, as we still continue to do now, that our knowledge is world knowledge and that we have a, a, a tremendous contribution to make. And, uh, you know, again, I go back to the, you know, the words of my, you know, of our great friend, Larry and I, uh, the Warren Lyons, who's a faith keeper from Onondaga Nation in Syracuse. Um, uh, Lauren, Oren says that, uh, that, um, you know, what we're in right now is a is a crisis. And he said that the only way for our survival to move forward, and he was instrumental in being able to create uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Coming from that perspective, his, his view of that, you know, in discussions with eminent Indigenous peoples that were, uh, that were uh, brought together to be able to create that document, comes down to really a four words after like 30 years of writing and 30 years of, of talking and, and researching together. He said all of that, that whole process, come, that declaration comes down to four words, value, change for survival. So, which means then if we're going to continue to survive in the world that we're living in now, we got to change our values. And no more, you know, should it be values of, I guess, competition, of, uh, of destruction at the expense and the destruction of the natural world for our own short-term benefit. It's really turning those things around and inheriting and understanding and engaging and supporting and honoring Indigenous values about how to live in place, how to live in land, how to live with one another the physical, the spiritual, all of those pieces that we uh, have held on to, those are the things that uh, the world actually needs to know right now. Uh, thank you, Dan. I, there's a lot in what you've just said, and, and I'm just in particular going to pick up on this idea that, um, you know, as you said, Indigenous knowledge, uh, you put it, it's not doesn't come from trial and error, but from many generations passed down, and, and its origins are in this uh, sort of in the relationships between people and the more than human, the rest of the natural world. And what's interesting, uh, I, I was thinking as you were talking, you know, this whole idea that of direct communication between humans and the rest of nature is something that the, uh, you know, Western science and Western worldviews are not very good at thinking through. Um, and yet, if you look at some of the, the cutting edge work in botany, for example, it's look, talking about how uh, how trees communicate among each among themselves in a forest, how they share things in a forest, um, and how they will even share with other species. And so Western science is catching up, I think, on uh, some of the uh, percepts that are that are there already in, in uh, your cultural understandings. Uh, and so this idea of uh, relations, I think I just want to turn with that idea to Larry, uh, because it seems to me central also to the Indigenous understanding of, uh, of treaties and of uh, how we were 
we being uh, settlers and indigenous people in this place that we now call Canada, how we were intended to um, work together um, to uh, live in this place. Larry, you've done a lot of thinking about treaty relations. As I understand it, Indigenous people in the Americas have a long history of treaties with one another, and such treaties helped to establish norms of good conduct between nations, and their renewal over time through ceremony and celebration was an important part of defining a people and its relationship to its neighbours. For example, there was an important treaty between your two peoples, the Anishinaabe and the peoples of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, about how to share the rich resources in the area that is now southeastern Ontario, from uh, around Toronto to, say, the border between Ontario, Quebec, and New York State today. Um, this treaty, going back to the 1100s, I think for the Haudenosaunee, was known as a dish with one spoon. My understanding is the name refers to the idea of people all eating out of a single dish, that is hunting in a shared territory, with the one spoon signifying that the people sharing the territory are expected to limit the game they take to leave enough for others and for the future. Uh, Nishnabic uh, scholar and activist Leanne Simpson has written an excellent article that I use in some of my classes describing these treaty processes among Indigenous people prior to contact, not noting how the Anishinaabe also saw themselves in Deech deep and rich treaty relationship with the animal nations. So this wasn't just about uh, between tribes. It was this history and cultural understanding of treaties as living relational commitments, which informed Indigenous people in Canada as they started to negotiate treaties with newcomers coming from Europe and particular representatives of the British Crown three centuries ago. Can I ask you to talk a bit, Larry, about the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the subsequent Treaty of Niagara? Why are these documents so important to understanding Canada as we know it today? And how do you understand the responsibilities laid out in these treaties regarding the relationship between Indigenous people and the Crown, the relationship between people and the diverse species we all rely upon in this land, which has come to become known about 100 years later as, as Canada? Thank you, Peter. Uh, great question. I'm glad you brought up uh, the dish with one spoon because it was a multi, in the true sense, a multinational, multilateral uh, agreement. And there were protocols. Um, and we had uh, the edge of the forest ceremony. Uh, and it was a ceremony in which you, um, you spent time um, polishing your relationship. Uh, and it was uh, predicated on uh, again, those responsibilities um, not only to pass uh, to, to our ancestors and, and to future generations, uh, but to uh, all, of, uh, all of the life. Uh, and so uh, there were responsibilities in monitoring whatever you're harvesting that you did it mindful of the fact you're sharing it um, with another nation, you're sharing it with, and both nations are committed to those future generations. They're uh, committed to the love of the the species that they're harvesting. So there was that understanding, and there was um, uh, there were uh, cross cultural practices that addressed uh, our understandings, and so we knew each other. It would be like uh, in Europe how people know five languages. Well, you know. Uh, we knew uh, we knew languages, we knew uh, cultural practices, and we looked forward to them. and we And we saw it as a, um, a celebration, uh, uh, a time of uh, being able to enrich that life, you know, that we have. We and we saw it uh, as as very important. And I have I had elders, one elder who passed away in the nineties, who talked about. Uh, it, meeting where three rivers joined not far from here and how we we met with um, Mohawk people and had done even through the periods where uh, Europeans talk about us um, fighting for different European powers and uh, uh, ignoring um, you know our relationship but my elders said that our history says otherwise there were some that lined up but that but there were also uh, relationships that endured those uh, uh, 
uh, colonial struggles uh, to take over our land um, and uh, maintain those uh, important relationships. Okay, so what about the, the proclamation of 1763? Well, uh, Sir William Johnson um, lobbied before the Privy Council uh, against uh, General Amherst, who just wanted to wage war, that uh, if you respect Indigenous peoples, you issue a proclamation that uh, uh, we are equal. You draw a line in the in the sand, so to speak, and north of that line is uh, Indigenous territory and shall ever be. And uh, you go and you make treaty based on um, William uh, Johnson's understanding. And again, he had uh, eight children with Molly Brandt, so um, he had a pretty good idea of uh, Haudenosaunee traditions, but he also uh, uh, knew well Anishinaabe traditions, and he, he knew uh, about things like uh, the covenant chain. He knew, um, he knew how to make wampum, much less uh, uh, what uh, its purpose was. Uh, he knew the ceremonies, and so when that uh, when the Treaty of Ni uh, of uh, 1764, Treaty of Niagara, convened in uh, early August of 1764, and 24 nations from across the a big chunk of the continent, some of uh, some of those nations took three months to get there and three months to get home. Uh, he also knew that if you're going to make a, an agreement. If, if uh, you're going to uh, create an alliance, that the way you, you do that is you do it in the most uh, solemn way that you, you do it in ceremony. So pipes uh, were brought out, uh, tobacco uh, was shared. And part of the deal that came from the 24 nations was that, okay, we'll, uh, we'll accept um, Western law. Uh, predominantly British law with concession, concessions to French law, but we expect you to honor our laws, uh, which are anchored in natural law. So uh, the agreement to share the land uh, was, was without equivocating on our fundamental responsibilities as Indigenous peoples to the land. Um, those uh, responsibilities... Uh, they're unshakable. Uh, as uh, an elder, actually Elder William Commanda, who influenced me uh, a lot, uh, uh, he said man can make all the laws he wants, but if, if those laws aren't anchored in natural law, he'll just, he'll hurt himself or even destroy himself. And so that's exactly what we're up against. But the relationship, the peace and friendship that was created at the Treaty of Niagara, which is considered the foundation of what is now uh, Canada, was based on that we would care for the land, that um, first and foremost, we would honor our responsibilities to creation. And the Crown can't say it didn't understand because it did, because it, it brought uh, pipes, it brought wampum, and it understood full well. And so when the treaty process was finalized, it was finalized in utmost solemn prayer, if ever, ever you tell your truth. Without any equivocation, you do so in that ceremony. And so the Crown knew that, and the Crown made their promises through Sir William Johnson. And of course, uh, the 24 nations also uh, made their their promise, and it actually was the reason that there was such great loyalty during the War of 1812. And without Indigenous loyalty, without uh, Indigenous sacrifice, um, the defense of uh, then the Crown's uh, borders with the upstart Americans, that war would have been lost. And so... Uh, there was a promise between General Brock and uh, Tecumseh, the indigenous leader, that there would be an indigenous state created in what are now the Midwestern uh, uh, states and in the prairie provinces in Canada. 
and so the British brought that up at the Treaty of Ghent, but at the Treaty of Ghent, there weren't any indigenous people. And But the Americans understood the commitment that the British Crown had made through General Brock to Tecumseh. And so Henry Clay, this uh, southern rabble rouser who the uh, northern representatives didn't like, but he ended up carrying the day, he basically out negotiated the British, and uh, the British just wanted to get it over. There was pressure to get out of war. Uh, people were, uh, their citizens were tired of the cost. And so they threw indigenous peoples overboard. However, in Article 9 of the Treaty of Ghent, they promised uh, to um, uphold everything that had been said, the Treaty of Niagara and uh, the Treaty of uh, Fort Stanwix and a couple other treaties. Uh, and they, they said all rights uh, will be um, honored and respected. But they actually had cooked up a scheme where there was no enforcement mechanism in the Treaty of Ghent. So it was the ultimate um, uh, integrity gap. And if you ask me, when it comes to reconciliation, what has happened since 1815, in which the the, uh, the Pledge of, of the Crown uh, Belt uh, was handed over to all but one of those uh, nations that were at the Treaty of Niagara. And uh, uh, that belt insinuated that um, it would be our love and affection that will uh, get us through in, in the future that there would be challenges, but we didn't know that they that the intent even then uh, was to abandon the relationship, abandon uh, for one side to imba- abandon the integrity associated with the truth spoken in 1764. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, any anything that wavers from that treaty in 1764 is treason. And there's a lot of treason been committed since uh, 1815. And reconciliation is to get back to that truth. And the beauty of reconciling and getting back to that point is we'll solve the biodiversity crisis. We'll solve uh, the uh, inappropriate relationships that we have with the land and water. And we'll also solve the inappropriate relationships um, that patriarchy uh, has inherently, um, the fact that we uh, we have not listened to women's voice. And uh, so I like to uh, call it balancing the canoe. Right now the canoe's taken on water, but uh, uh, we're managing to slowly but surely tip it back the way it's meant to be and uh and stop it from taking on water but it's still taking on water that's uh, the loss of biodiversity that's the increasing climate change that's the missing and, and murdered indigenous women and girls uh but at least we're talking and at least we're even having the awkward conversations that are uncomfortable but we're having them and so there's hope and our youth are our hope too miigwech Miigwech, uh, Larry. I, th- I think many of our listeners, uh, this will be a new interpretation and a new look back at uh, Canadian history. And I hope people are inspired to uh, look up these treaties and uh, you know learn more, learn more about uh, about it. And uh, I think you're very you're very gentle and kind by referring to what happened between 1812 and today as an integrity gap. Um, your your second word treason is is probably uh, more appropriate. Um, and but I just want to ask you just to follow up before we go back to Dan, um, because at the end of what you were talking about, you were talking about how you see in this uh, era of at least talk about reconciliation, um, some hope. And and I know that you've been part of various processes that are trying to. Um, let's call it rekindle the spirit of the Treaty of Niagara. Uh, you, you've mentioned the, the Pathways 1 process, which is uh, uh, meant to um, uh, bring a key aspect of the conven- UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the idea of, of uh, having protected areas over a, a substantial part of Canada and doing that in a way that really um, is in collaboration with uh, Canada's and Indigenous people. And you've been part of that process and uh, have introduced me to the idea of uh, ethical space. 
um, which I think, you know, I, I just want you to connect the dots for us here, because the sense I'm getting is that the ethical space that you and others talk about today is is what you feel like was intended back in uh, uh, in the era of the Royal Proclamation and the Treaty of Niagara. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Uh, absolutely, Peter. Ethical space, yeah, isn't something uh, we invented. In fact, we borrowed uh, as much as we could from those uh, uh, those gifts, gifts of knowledge and uh, and ways of knowing and and ways of relating, and applied them in the Pathways One process. I still pinch myself that it happened. Um, that you had representatives from all the territories, provinces, the feds. Uh, Indigenous peoples, obviously we couldn't represent every nation, but um, that uh, we came we came together and we looked at uh, Canada's treaty obligations under the Conventions on Biological Diversity and Climate Change and said to ourselves, uh, let's do this in the best way uh, we know how. And so there was an agreement uh, with the minister at the time, uh, Catherine McKenna, and uh, with the Minister of Environment, her co-chair, um, Shannon Phillips from Alberta. And uh, that was led by Dr. Reg Kroshu. Um And so we spent time, uh, well, first of all, we launched it in pipe ceremony. And then we, um, we spent time talking about those seven gifts because uh, that's the tradition that... Uh, um, uh, Dr. Kroshu and I share. Uh, so out of it came important recommendations, um, including the recognition of some aspects of our worldview that we are one species among many. Uh, William Commander used to say we're no more important than the smallest insect. And uh, at first I went, oh, and now for me it's so obvious. So you know, there were there were uh, a sharing of uh, knowledge systems, which is part of ethical space. There was, uh, and so are the in this case those uh, uh, seven gifts. But it could be many other indigenous iterations, uh, indigenous ways of of knowing. And uh, uh, we operated on the basis of a uh, circle. Everybody's equal. We said that in the opening pipe ceremony that one pe uh, people uh, participated. Um, what was said uh, should be done um, without fear, without fear of even the boss subordinate relationship uh, or other uh, models of hierarchy that uh, there was no room for a hierarchy in even a shared governance system involving uh, indigenous uh, uh, ways of knowing. One prominent uh, woman uh, came to uh, me at the IUCN annual meeting uh, after this process, and she said, Larry, I, I don't know, but I just feel like we did ceremony before and at the end of every meeting. She said, I, I, I don't know, but it seems like the smudge really uh, united our minds and our hearts, and we were able to do things that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And I thought to myself, yep been working on that for thousands of years. Happy to share it with you. I mean, that's what went through my mind. Uh, and it was very much um, part of uh, the process. You know, we shared the, our, our best uh, uh, traditions, ways of knowing. And I actually think um, that we rise together and uh, Canada's conservation vision where our leap years ahead of anything uh, that has happened in this country um, in a long, long time, and I. But I'm kind of surprised how quickly a government, um, uh, Angos, environmental, non-government organizations, a academia, fall back to the de facto way of uh, being, and uh, so that you know, I'll wrap this up by saying. Uh, I think um, the way we're going to address these big problems is transformational thinking. That's going to take effort. It's going to take some discomfort. It's going to take uh, not being habitual, but being mindful. Miigwech. Miigwech, uh, Larry. I think what you've uh, just described for us is um, really the, the, you know, this goes to the starting questions that I was asking Dan about in terms of what we can learn from uh, 
indigenous cultures in relation to this uh, crisis that we're going through now of climate and biodiversity and so on. And uh, what you're talking about in the ethical space um, idea is uh, is about respectful process, relational process, uh, deep listening, commitment, values. Uh, and Dan talked about we need a value change for survival as being core to uh, ideas like sustainable development. So, uh, you know, I think we've drawn a nice circle in this conversation here today. I have a last question for Dan, and I, I, I'd like you to re- reflect a bit, Dan, on how everything we've been talking about relates to this current moment of environmental politics in Canada, uh, which remain a time of considerable contestation, despite growing dialogue about how we might move forward uh, towards reconciliation. For example, over the last decade, we've seen the rise of uh, Idle No More. It's a peaceful revolutionary social movement that's taken root across Turtle Island, uh, mainly led by Indigenous women and youth. Idle No More's stated goal is to honour Indigenous sovereignty and protect the land, water and sky. It was initially a response to the dismantling of environmental protection laws by the uh, Harper government in Canada and has now grown into a continent-wide network of urban and rural Indigenous people working with non-Indigenous allies to further Indigenous rights and environmental protection and seeing those things as connected. And while, of course, there's some First Nations that are supportive of pipeline projects on their territories for the jobs they're expected to create, on the whole, we've seen tremendous Indigenous resistance to resource extraction efforts in Canada. Whether it's shale gas fracking on the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq, in northern New Brunswick or indigenous resistance to pipelines on the west coast. How do you see uh, the relationship between the indigenous knowledge that we've been talking about today and and these calls for respect and entrenchment of indigenous rights in Canada? Oh man, uh, <laughs> another another good question and there's probably another long answer on this one. I guess the premise of everything is is really understanding that you know as what has enabled us to survive as Indigenous peoples anywhere in the world in place over a very long period of time is a very strict understand, a very strict set of, of laws uh, that is sometimes oftentimes referred to as natural law um, that has really proven for us over a long period of time that living by those uh, is not law as in how we understand law today. It, it is the is a manifestation of of great of great beauty, and uh, I think that the that the when you hear the indigenous voice right from the very beginning, uh, and again when you go back in our in our history as as Haudenosaunee, you know our uh, history has not been a one of uh, you know uh, bright shiny things and uh, and you know all uh, flowers and, and roses. Um, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes, uh, and in our past, and uh, and you know, you, you go back in history and be able to see those things, and, and but because of that, you know, our our people have learned, and we keep those uh, kind of mistakes and the understanding of those mistakes alive. So the reason for that is that never to do them again, and so the idea behind it is that over a period of time that we have addressed. And we can be been continually renewed in our humanity as to what that actually means to live in place, what it actually means to care for one another, what it actually means to have a relationship, you know, with the natural world uh, in both a physical and a spiritual aspect of it. And so that unique way of life that we've been given as Indigenous peoples in the world has really enabled all of us, as I mentioned earlier, to really flourish as civilizations. Um Going back to that understanding of that, the messages, the ways of life, the the values, the principles, the understandings of that, the words have always and the thinking have always been the same throughout time. So that when the visitors came, the newcomers came to our our lands, uh, we shared those with them openly. And uh, and our message then, and even though, as Larry pointed out, many things have transpired since then much to our detriment and much to the detriment of the natural world as well that our message has 
continually been constant all the way through. It is, it has been continuous and it has been constant. And so we've been given, you know, a unique opportunity now in this, in, in, at this time, in this process that some refer to as reconciliation, uh, to be able to have a voice and to be able to have the opportunity to share and to bring knowledge forward. And again, the message has always been the same, right? From our very earliest ancestors to where we are today. And the, but the point of it is that as if we're going to move forward and begin to understand the environmental issues and crises that were here, these are not just economic issues. Easy to put them in that way. They're not polit, not just political issues. They're not just social issues. They're all of them. Plus, they're a spiritual issue as well. And more, even more so, I think that there's a unique, uh, a heightened consciousness that is coming up, you know, from peoples from all around the world that are understanding that we can, we cannot continue to live the way we are, that there's a cost to maintaining this kind of so-called way of life that we are, are all sort of somewhat enjoying and some are at the expense of this way of life. But the idea behind it is that it, our, this way of life that we build is really, uh, as human beings in a modern context, is at the expense of the natural world, and we can't live like that anymore. Um, so understanding that, and then going back to those original understandings of it, this becomes really a spiritual question. And so what we oftentimes refer to that in our classrooms is that we talk about that this time in particular is 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 all about the uh, the restrengthening and, and the, I want to call it the revitalization of human spiritual integrity. So it's going back and understanding that we as human beings, as sacred spirits, in our relationship to all of the spiritual world around us, all of the non, you know, the unseen world around us, and, uh, and engaging with all of nature as beings, that, that we have a relationship to them and they to us. And our responsibility is to care for them and to work for the continuation of life. So for us, a lot of these things that people, um, and you kind of talked about that, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, botany, a botanist understanding that, you know, trees talk to one another. Our ancestors knew that, you know, millennia ago, uh, many millennia ago. And we were told that that's how they communicate with one another. And, uh, and I really love the way, you know, my, um, uh, my great friend, uh, Norma General, uh, who's um, uh, a faith keeper at um, uh, Kuga Longhouse at, at Grand River. She talks about this, she says, and, and just imagine this. She says, imagine in your mind a beautiful forest. And she says, that beautiful forest, I see all types of different trees in there. Those trees have attracted all types of different animals and insects and butterflies and all types of things have thr thrived there. And she says, when you walk in there, how beautiful it smells and how beautiful the sounds are and how beautiful the sights are. And she says, so when you see that, uh, she says, understand that that's what the creator has provided for us. But she says, you know, if we as the human beings had the uh, power to be able to roll back the, 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 the earth, we would see that all of those trees through their roots are all touching one another. They're, it's just as though that they are holding hands with one another. And she says, now she says, understanding that we as the human beings are just like that forest. No uh, tree is exactly like the other tree. They're all different trees of different sizes. Even the ones that are the same uh, in terms of their species are different in their appearance and different in the way that they are, that they look. So there's pine trees, oak trees, maple trees, um, poplar trees, all types of different trees that exist side by side in there. She says, that's just like us, the human beings. We are all different and we are all different, uh, like different trees. We are all different people. But she says, just like the trees are, we should be as human beings. We should be the ones that are all holding hands, working for the continuation of life, just like those trees are. So, you know, that to me, as Larry had talked about earlier, that's the solution to, you know, our way forward in, in whatever venue you want to call it, whether it's reconciliation or whether it's just really getting down to business and understanding that if we're going to live, we have to live uh, by Indigenous principles and values. I want to thank you both uh, so much for uh, for sharing your knowledge today. Uh, you each uh, have deep knowledge that I think is really valuable for the students in our courses that are going to be listening to this. And uh, it was an honor for me to uh, to spend this time with you both. Um, 
one of the things I heard you talking about just now, Dan, was, uh, you know, just in response to this sort of political question about Idle No More is you just said, you know, the message has been continuous and constant uh, for for so long, right? And that's so uh, central to uh, this story today is that there is a... Um, uh, there is a, a deep message we can all learn from uh, from I- I being indigenous on the land as a as a as a way of being that uh, can uh, can tell us a lot today. And and the two of you, I think, really helped uh, our listeners uh, get some tastes of that from the perspectives that you bring as uh, Haudenosaunee and uh, and Algonquin. So uh, I I just want to give you a chance if you have any final words for our our students. Uh, Larry? Just that no matter uh, what walk of life uh, students may pursue later on, if they benefit from this land, they share the responsibilities to this land. That message is part of natural law. Uh, and if, if we don't honor that law collectively, uh, we won't improve the circumstances we find ourselves in right now. Uh, the takeaway is that we are connected to everything, um, that uh, Western science is telling us the more we push uh, nature, although I feel like the way it's being said, it's as if we're not part of that. But uh, uh, the more we push uh, the rest of life in our greed, in our obsession with a, a lifestyle that's not sustainable, that we that all good science underscores the fact that it isn't sustainable, um, the more uh, we will create havoc. But we have an alternative, a beautiful al- alternative, and uh, we just we need to work together. And we need to listen. We need to listen to those trees. Uh, we need to listen to the land, to the water. And, uh, uh, you know, this is really a sum of all. It's... Uh, I feel all rights in Canada, we say section 35 rights are collective. Far as I'm concerned, all rights are collective because we're all connected. The word for that in Algonquin is Genoway Daganuk. And that's understood from the four sources of intelligence, which includes empathy and spirituality. So find, find a way uh, to make sure that, you, that uh, you're part of making good decisions, that you don't fall into the trap of uh, greed, um, competition that's unhealthy where somebody's getting hurt um, and find uh, find that um, you know Pomana Zewan you know living that good life with uh, with those good relationships thanks for listening I, I wish your students uh, a great future uh, you are the future and uh, uh, I wish you well miigwech miigwech uh, Larry and uh, Dan do you have any final words my message would be to really be fearless in your pursuit of knowledge. You know, judge well the, the knowledge and to see that, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. If it works for the continuation of life, then it fulfills our responsibility as human beings. You know, within our traditions as Haudenosaunee, we were so fortunate that we have a lot of different properties that we've been given. But one, you know, in particular, the teachings of Handsome Lake, Skanya Dario, uh, they talk about Handsome Lake had this vision uh, he was given a, a vis- visitation by beings, uh, four beings that took him up and, and showed him different things. And they showed him that we as the human beings have two paths to follow. And we have to make a choice whether we're going to work for the continuation of life or whether we're going to work uh, for, uh, I guess, really the destruction of the earth. One way ends in pain, hardship and suffering. And the other way ends in health and happiness and beauty and love. And so we as human beings have to open up our minds to that and to understand that that now is the time to be able to make a choice. And so my message to your students is really to, you know, to open up your heart, to open up your mind, to open up your feelings, to open up your spirit and to embrace those things that work for the continuation of life. And so, Peter, I want to thank you and thank you to my brother, my great brother, Larry. And I want to wish you the best, uh, you know, going forward and the, the best to your students as well in their life, in their lifelong journey of learning. And so thank you so much for inviting me. Niawe, Dan. Um, 
thank you for those words. And thank you to both of you and miigwech to you, Larry, for participating in today's EcoPolitics podcast. Um, for our listeners, don't forget to check out other episodes in the series at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. Please do send us your feedback on these episodes. We really appreciate hearing from our listeners. And I look forward to speaking with you again in our next episode. Thank you.